TZ Penny is well known in the independent board game design scene. He has been published by various companies, including Dice Hate Me and Eagle Griffin Games. His most recent publication is The Unprofiteer. He's got a wonderful lot to say about positive player interaction. I'm going to get right out of the way and let him get to it. All right, thank you. Um, so, hi everybody, I'm TZ Petty III, and I'm here to talk to you about game design because I'm an award winning game designer whatever that means. And positive player interaction is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So if you're looking for something that's like a game design 101 class, think more like this is a game design like 300 class. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to go over some of the things that talk about uh, basically interaction in games and everything, but we're going to focus on positive player interaction towards the end and just kind of give an overview of how you can use that in game design. So if you're thinking about doing game design, this is kind of a something that you can think about, and it'll, I don't know, get you thinking about it in different ways. So, before we start, let's see if I can do this here. Um, it's not really—I don't know if it's really surviving the uh, zombie apocalypse, if that's positive play interaction or not. But it probably will help. I am TC Petty the Third, and who am I? I am from <coughs> Central Pennsylvania, and I've grown, lived there my entire life, and I come from a low to middle class family. So I'm kind of laid back, and I'm not used to talking to large groups, so hopefully this will help. I'm a dealer at a casino, though, so that's helped me get a little less nervous. So if you see me, I'll shake for a little bit, and then I'll kind of ease into it a little bit. Um, so I deal blackjack and poker part-time, and it's, I don't know, it's fun. It keeps me dealing games, keeps me playing with cards, doing things that I like. But then I get to see a lot of emotional reactions from people. It's interesting. I'm also a proud bubbler, so I, 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 uh, Bowling Springs Junior Senior High School graduates. We are bubblers because of an artesian well nearby. And I am not so proud of being a mountaineer. However, I don't know if that goes over well here or not, because <laughs> it's West Virginia. But I feel like I was an English major there, and it felt like that really wasn't what I should have done. I followed a girlfriend to college, and that's not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a game designer, but uh, going to uh, English major too, I think I'm at odds with most everybody here, so I think we're all enemies. But since I'm a game designer, we are no longer enemies, because most everybody that is in math and sciences and engineering fields, they all, for some reason, like game design, tinkering with systems and statistics and all that. But I'm going to tell you that right now, if you're looking for uh, formulas, how to do this, this is not what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking more about feel and how uh, players interact. And as you can tell, interaction is the main thing that I do. That's me. So this is my kind of emoji for positive player interaction. But it's really, there's no real good one for player. That's like Playboy bunnies. I don't know. <laughs> so positive player interaction. We should start talking about that now. But we're not going to. We're going to talk about player interaction. So to get to get a good idea of how positive player interaction works, now we'll get into just interaction in general. So interaction in games comes in two like subsets, I guess two forms. One is the direct and indirect, and the other is negative and positive. So for example, direct interaction is a kind of like the Pokemon thing. I choose you. So I'm picking that one person or like two out of the group to have something happen. It's an active thing. It happens immediately. It's something that is kind of visceral. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know who you're doing it to. And they know exactly who is doing that to them. So they can be spiteful later, right? So that's a direct interaction. Indirect interaction is a kind of like passive aggressive. Like I said, I choose, I choose the Gmabra. Um, passive, which means you're just doing something. If there's a card game where you take a card from the middle and everyone else has that option, now they don't have the option of that card. You go, oh, I like this card. You might want it, but whatever. But it doesn't directly affect anyone. It's everyone's still going to have to wait and take their turn and take that thing. But they, it's not necessarily direct. Like It's not in your face. In this lecture, I'm not talking about positive player interaction in cooperative games. If you've ever played a game where it's just purely cooperative, you're working against the game, it's all positive. Like, if you, unless there's like a traitor element or something, someone's working against the system, 
Like everybody is working together. It's a good thing all the time. So I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm talking about cooperative elements and collaborative elements in purely competitive games. So um, negative player interaction. All right, for the camera, everyone, boo. Negative player interaction, boo. boo. Yeah, it sucks. So it's Legos. I, I use the Lego guys because they're cute. Um, but yeah, negative player interaction, um, <clears throat> this is the problem. And this is what I foresee as a problem. And some people don't. But I'll read this out loud because it's a blurb and it's hard to see. When player interaction is mentioned in reference to board gaming, the connotation is always negative. Whether through destructive take that methods or lighter, indirect denial of resources, player interaction is assumed to be a purely advantageous uh, for one party and harmful for the other. So most people, when they see this, and this is not some, this is something specific, pretty much to board games, because a lot of people really do like uh, you have MMOs in, uh, um, and and uh, team games online, and people really think of that as, hey, if we want this positive interaction. Well, in board games, for some reason, there's this this idea that interaction only exists if it's negative, if it's direct. So when people say, this game doesn't have any interaction, they mean this game doesn't have any direct negative player interaction, even though it does have interaction. So we'll start with indirect negative player interaction. Before we get into positive, we got to explain negative, because that's the thing that everybody is used to. Indirect negative player interaction is negative interaction that affects all players, although not equally. It could be like some. So in this case, uh, there's the first example is exclusivity or denial. In this case, like I said, maybe there's a row of cards. I take that card. It's mine. No one else can have it. That's it. You're just denying other people an option. So that's one form of indirect player interaction. And it's kind of, it doesn't feel as bad. You feel lighter. You feel like, oh, well, I have to take this, right? Um, global effects, another, another uh, uh, type. And global effects are effects that affect all the players. Kind of like, I'll give an example, like if you said all, play, uh, all players, uh, whenever a blue card is played, you, all player, or you lose a point. Right? Whenever a blue card is played, you lose a point. So anytime a player at the table plays a blue card, they lose a point. It's not directly towards anyone, but if you know someone has like 17 blue cards in their deck, okay, well then you're really kind of affecting them the most. And then the other two, so those are the two main, and I'll just give you an example of uh, area majority and trader mechanic. So area majority is kind of a subset here. Um, there's two things called area control and area majority. If you've ever played Risk, there's area control, and that's where you take over a spot and it's yours and you only have pieces there. Area majority is where you have some pieces of your dudes, some dudes, and this is a technical term by the way, dudes. If you've ever, dudes on a map is a real thing. So, dudes is a technical term. Area majority in this case, I have more dudes than you. But I might have more dudes than whoever, that person, that player, that player, it doesn't matter. All I know is that I have more dudes than you. And that's all I care about, right? <clears throat> so, it's not as direct as some of these other ones. You could say it's slightly direct. Um, and then the trader mechanics. So, this is going back to like cooperative games. If you have a trader in a game, in this case, I'm really a Cylon. I don't know if anyone's done Battlestar Galactica. Like that. That's, that's the game that does that, right? So even the threat of having a uh, traitor is something that affects everybody, but isn't direct. So indirect. And this is my favorite parts. I love negatives. So what's the bad part about these things? So indirect, this is what people call multiplayer solitaire. Like I said before, direct interaction is what people consider to be interaction. So when you have multiplayer solitaire, multiplayer solitaire means that you have pretty much no interaction going on. And the reason why people think it's this way is because you're not actually directly stabbing anybody, right? Um, then there's also runaway leader issues. So if someone gets ahead, they tend to stay ahead because there's no way to directly, like, directly affect them. So, they, so you have to introduce other mechanisms of the game or something else to give I don't know, negative feedback loops. So these, these are ideas of like things that are bad if someone gets ahead. But it does have these issues. Then you have emotional detachment and thematic dissonance. And this is, a, 
This is a big problem, and it results in esoteric European town names in your game title. Games like Kalis and Carcassonne and uh, uh, Mikorinos and, oh, it just keeps going on, Isfahan. All these games have no, like, because this happens, because the game is abstracted by these actions, there's really good systems there, but they don't have any thematic relevance, so they have to apply some sort of elevated thing. And so in these cases, you'll have this emotional detachment because you feel like in these games you're taking a managerial role. You're not on the ground floor. You are, I'm sending my worker there. I'm doing this thing, and it's not me. It's somebody else or my army or whatever. So there's a little bit of that, and there's abstractness to all the mechanics, which causes a little thematic dissonance in the sense that you don't feel like you're actually doing the thing you're doing. So there's also direct negative player interaction. This is the big one. This is the one that everybody knows and everybody can, can you know, understand. You're just a negative interaction that affects fewer than all opponents. So, for example, if I engage someone in conflicts, right? If I say, oh, I'm going to attack you, that's, uh, that's uh, negative, direct negative player interaction. And it's the most common form. And that's why a lot of games have combat in them. Because it's easy. You can understand that it's conflict. And then, there's actions that target a player and their stuff, and this is a little different than take that, which I, uh, I put at the bottom here. And I put it at the bottom for a reason. But this is stuff that you might know ahead of time could happen, maybe you've played the game once or twice, and you can see that these things are going to happen, there's bad things that could happen, and you need to be prepared for them. And someone does that. Maybe they blow up your castle, maybe they blow up, they give you minus two points. That's what happens, right? And then another one is kind of like Texas Hold'em, where someone is calling someone else a liar. Or they're bluffing and saying, I'm going to do this thing, and then other people have to decide if they want to call them out on that, right? That is another form of direct negative player interaction. I like this one the best. I like it because, I don't know, it doesn't feel as mean. It just feels like you're being sneaky, right? And the final one is take that. Take that as part of the holy trinity of bad game design. So the holy trinity of bad game design is what I call the three things that all new designers tend to add to their games because they don't know any better. And these are classic things that have been in games for a long time that modern game design has tried to push off of the side. So in this case, we have roll and move, player elimination, and take that. It's not the fact that you're actually rolling dice and then it's and moving. It's the fact that you have no choice in the matter. You roll the dice, you move that many spaces, that's it. So it's, it's no control. It's taking actions and uh, choice away from the player. And that's what we, in modern game design, we try to give choice to the player and avoid that. Player elimination is just bad because people, I mean, if you're playing a game of Risk, for example, you might be playing for five hours. If someone gets eliminated in the first hour, they've got to sit there and watch for four hours. And anytime you're not engaging a player, you are failing as a game. Like, as entertainment. Right? Games are entertainment. So, if no one, someone's just sitting there, they're not being entertained. I mean, maybe they're on their phone, so that could be fun. Um, and finally, take that is the big, the big thing. That is where oh, I draw this card. Oh, man, all right, you lose 15 points. Ha, 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 that's so great. Or, I, you know, it's like I roll this die. Oh, man, I exploded your castle by accident. Great. That's awesome. You know, these are really stupid things that just randomize, randomly happen that you have like a very small amount of control over, and there's countless games that do this. You'll find this countless games like this on Kickstarter, too. So if you want to look at Kickstarter, you can find a million games that take that. But let's look at the bad. So the bad of direct, and this is one, this is one subject that I think is really specifically bad, right? If you have too much of this, it's really can alienate a lot of players. So uh, if people do not like games where they have to be in your face all the time, you have to be punching other people in the throat, no. They want something a little more subtle. So, but let's go for these kind of things that I was talking about. Like the, the idea that early game target is nearly random. If you have a card that ha affects somebody and you have to play it or have to do something, you kind of don't know who to go to because you're just being bad. You're just being mean. Um, and that's, that is actually a legitimate problem for people starting games, right? 
then ganging up or bashing the leader. Ganging up is really bad because that means somebody's weak and we can all jump on top of them. And because we can do that, we can all score points, but that one player is having a really bad time while everybody else is having the greatest time ever. So that's ganging up. Bashing the leader is a little different because bashing the leader is where you get cards and you see that the person's in the lead in the game and you're supposed to bash them because they're in the lead and you should play this bad card on them. So you feel like this compulsion to bash and it causes this kind of ripple effect. Games in the 80s and 90s were terrible about this. They could get stuck in these endless circles of death, death spirals, where people could not complete a game and it would go on for hours because you would just keep playing a card. Fireball Island, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Fireball Island. It's this crazy, like, board game that's like this big. It comes in a box like that. It was like the excessive vacuum formed mountain and you like, you flick off these little fireballs that go down. But at the end of the game, like you do all this stuff, and you're like, oh, this is cool, cool. At the end of the game, it's just a race from here to here. And every turn, someone plays a card that stops the next person or starts a fireball, and everyone goes back to the spot over and over and over and over again, until randomly someone wins and gets through. So it's like, it's like 40 minutes of this at the very end of the game. So anyway. Um, also, it punishes timid players, people who are, like myself, a little bit more timid. They don't really like these games, so they can't, they can't, they don't have the killer instinct, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna help them. Um, also, it's highly tactical and perceived as less skillful. That means there's, you're playing, strategy is long term. When the game has the board changed so much that when it comes back to your turn, you just play a card, and you see what you can do, that's tactics. Strategy is long term. So it's perceived less skillful for a good reason. Right? There's, no, there's no skill to just playing a card and seeing what happens. Right? And then there's whining. I hate this so much. People whine so much whenever they throw like bad stuff that happens to them, especially the bash and the leader. With uh, bad, you have whining and table flipping. And this is like people at the end of the game they are really mad at what's going on in the game. And a lot of direct, net angry interactions can cause losses of friendship, people getting so over-invested in the game. That's my, uh, Nick, ben Nick Bentley is a game designer friend that I have that came up with the idea of over-investment syndrome. And a lot of people who don't play board games, the reason why they don't is not just because they don't like the silliness of board games, but because they want it to be like real life, and they become invested as if it is a real thing, and that's a problem. You know, you you feel it, and you flip the table, and you get angry, and you whine. But hey, all right, positive player interaction. We'll finally get to positive player interaction. So everybody applaud. We got yay! <laughs> so there's elephants, and they're not kissing, but they're giving flowers. Um, <coughs> Positive player interaction is something I think gets looked over. And so I bring this up because I think why should you use positive player interaction is a question that I don't even think gets asked. But just to start, I mean, before we get into the idea of examples of positive player interaction, how people have used it to like a really good, put it to good use in games that have other systems, right? Um, I wanted to give you an idea of like what are the reasons for putting them in. So, uh, player, positive player interaction, like I talked about with Viva Java, right? I discovered this emergent social element with positive player interaction. If I can go to a spot and someone else can go there too, it's kind of like I want them to, so I can advertise that. And I'm planning ahead before I even place my piece. I'm saying, hey, are you going to go to that spot? I really want to go to that region. Do you want to go with that? Okay, cool. We can do this. You already have your turn planned out way before someone else comes in and screws that whole thing up, right? So. It's, it's really interesting. Um, also, early game, it makes sense, as opposed to negative interaction early. It makes sense. You, you do something nice for someone because it's so early, you can't see 30 turns ahead. You just see that, okay, well, it's in our best interest to do this thing. Let's trade that item, or let's, let's uh, go to that spot. That's cool. It's a natural impulse, right, to help other people. And we kind of forget that when we're playing board games, but it's a natural impulse to want to help somebody, right? And that is why I think it's a more accurate representation of life. Because, 
again, I keep going back to Viva Java, but like Viva Java to me is like a business simulator. And you don't really get ahead in business by doing your own thing, going rogue all the time. You have to work with other people. A lot of times you'll be signed to teams and stuff that you don't want to actually do, but you're dragged along into it sometimes too. And that's, I don't know, having full control of everything that you do is to me a little bit misrepresentation of how life works, right? And then, um, and finally, it adds excitement to the mid-game and it eliminates a ton of downtime. If you're talking, if you are involved when it's not your turn, that's awesome. You want to be involved when it's not your turn. This is not like, like we were talking about how formulas work. If you make a formula for game design, it does not include the idea that you want to be involved and interject yourself into someone else's turn. So being involved all times, even when it's not your turn, is a really cool thing. The key difference between positive player interaction and indirect negative player interaction is that uh, it opens up new options for all the players. That means that, that uh, as opposed to removing one option, you may open up a set of options, you may uh, open up a new technology tree for other players, or it may just be one thing that you just offer, right? I build a house, that, or I build a business, now everybody can go to that business, right? That's positive player interaction that's indirect. Everybody is affected. It's also incidental aid that's proximity, that uh, proximity to another player might provide. So uh, I was going to give an example, uh, but I think the best is stocks, and this is stocks that uh, may change, uh, where a company that you're investing in may change hands during the course of the game. So if you invest in somebody's company, thinking that they're going to do something cool, it's cool, but that person may abandon that stock and move on to something else later. So it's this cool building up of the stock and making everything better, but it may not result in uh, helping one specific player or helping a group of players. It's uh, kind of indirect in that way. Some examples. Brewcrafters. This game is all about microbreweries. So each person runs their own microbrewery and creates beer and different recipes over the course of three years. Um, so you'll be growing some things in your own farm and you'll be actually using these resources uh, to create the beer that you're creating. And you have to push it through this whole system, your production system, and put it out in actual bottles and give it to the, the world, right? But the collaboration group allows players that when they brew, they can also just add like a little extra to this collaboration here. So if you add, so if you add uh, two hops here, at the end of the game, but when, when this collaboration brew is complete, you'll score two points and get money. And not only that, if nobody finishes this by the end, you at least get a point. So throwing stuff in there is not a bad thing, it just helps. And it helps everybody to throw something in. So I really like that kind of thing. It's not direct, though. It's indirect. I put it on there, and then so I, I'm in, inspiring others to follow me in that aspect. Um, but it's a cool, a cool idea. Terra Mystica. If you haven't played Terra Mystica, Terra Mystica is a fantastic game. It's just really, really heavy. Um, but uh, one of the things that it does that I think is interesting is really does a good model of how cities kind of build up. Because basically, in this game, if you build next to someone, you give them power. If they upgrade their building and they're, you're next to them now after you've built there, you get power. If you upgrade your building, you get power. So you see these, the different buildings that are better, they've been upgrading them. And they've been giving the people beside them this extra power, which they can use as currency, right? That's a really cool like, way of creating a mutual beneficial system. And it's indirect because I can jump in and I can be part of that system too. But it also gives a cool model for how cities build and how you know, different people of different backgrounds can kind of work together and build up a cityscape due to the fact that being prox proximity to each other actually improves your own businesses, right? That's why you see strip malls pop up and you see like five gas stations on the same corner because everybody's going there for gas. And Puerto Rico is my favorite game. Puerto Rico, if you haven't played Puerto Rico, it's a classic from 2003. It is still awesome. It is amazing. It is a really cool game. Um, and the aspect of this is role selection. So in role selection, you are going to, in this uh, form of role selection, you're going to pick one of these roles. So there's like uh, five that are left over. Someone's already picked something. But you pick one of these roles. You get to take that action with a bonus. And everybody else at the table gets to take that action as well. 
So you get a bonus for taking that, starting the chain, but then everybody gets to take that. And then the next person will do it, next person will do it, next person will do it. So it's really cool in the sense that it feels like mini turns. It feels like you are always part of the game. It feels like you can never go to a bathroom. It's like a no bathroom break game. Right? That's what I call these types of games. A lot of, a lot of positive player interaction is no bathroom break games. So let's do direct positive player interaction because, again, direct, indirect, kind of flip sides of the same coin. So direct interaction, this is the kind of interaction I am most interested in. Just like <coughs> when people say direct negative player interaction is the most, uh, is the most uh, visceral and immediate kind of interaction, this is also on the opposite side, the one I'm most interested in. And again, it affects a group of players or two players less than the whole. So I'll give an example in uh, Game Compounded. This is another game that's out by Dice Games. I think Brew Crafters was another Dice Me game. I'm just using Dice Me games and advertising them. So um, Compounded has the grant ability. And if you look at this card, uh, Hydrogen Peroxide. So if you're not familiar with Compounded, I guess like, uh, I, I keep forgetting. Every game I have to explain. So Compounded is a game where you create these different chemical compounds, right? And you use the actual, like, you would have hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, the little jewels that you would place on that represent those things, and you build them. Uh, when you complete it, you would get these points, but you have to grant another person one level on one of their research tracks, which was actually helping them. Now, the thing that's, so, on a face value, okay, that's bad for me, I have to do that. But, if you use it to your advantage, you can make a deal ahead of time. One of the rules is that anybody can place anywhere. They don't have to place on their own. So if I had claimed this one as my own, someone else could still place on it. So I could say, hey, anybody, if you want to put a hydrogen on here, we're going to finish this this round, and I will grant you whatever research you want. So you can start making little deals using that grant. It's just a little emergent gameplay aspect that's direct between players. And I, I really, like, really like those direct choices. Bonanza. This is, uh, this is my example of negotiation and trading. There's a lot of trading games. I, one of the early ones was Settlers of Catan for me, or Catan. Um, and in these games, you have positive player interaction that deals with trading. It might actually, and some people say, oh, well, one side is actually getting a raw deal. Well, I don't think so. In a lot of trading games, it is good for you to get rid of something, and it is good for something else. And the, a good trading game has a different value of place on every good each time. So this game does a really good job of that because you only have two fields in front of you. You can buy another field for later, but it takes away your victory points. You're trying to score coin, gold coins, right? So in this case, this person has four wax beans. I don't know if you can see it on the bottom, but it has four wax beans. Now, <clears throat> if he wants to plant another type of bean, he's got to plant it in the second field. The beginning of your... You, the, key little issue of this game is you get a hand of cards and you have to keep them in the exact order you got. And at the beginning of your turn, the first card in your hand has to go face up. So if you have two fields and they're, they don't match the type of card you have in your hand, you just have to get rid of one of the fields. So if you look down there, uh, well, let me just point to this because it's better if you can see that. Uh, four. If he has four, he can flip this over and get one gold coin for turning that in. But if he keeps it for a while, he can get, if he gets 11 wax beams in here, he's going to get 4 points when he turns it out. So he wants to kind of keep this. So the game result, so what that, the game does is offers, a cho uh, offers an opportunity to during a player's turn where they will draw two cards and put them face up. They can take those cards if they want, but they can trade them away to other players. And players can trade cards from their hands to them. That means you can affect the distribution of cards in your hand so you don't have to play the crappy card that will ruin your game. Right? You, can, you can trade it away and you can give it to other players. It's a really cool system um, and what it does is it puts impetus on the trade. Because if you don't trade those away and maybe even gift them to people because you don't want them, you have to take them. So. Creating an atmosphere of positivity is good because if you just refuse everybody, they're going to refuse you, and it's just going to turn into a downward spiral. <clears throat> I mean, then finally, uh, Viva Java, there's a little investment token, so you can see it right here. <coughs> the, this yellow player has decided to invest in this group. What happened was, before they decided to make a copy block, 
anyone who had an investment token can place an investment token on another player or, or on another team. And then they, be, they get the benefit of whatever that blend is. So in this case, it's scoring two points a turn, right? Whatever, whatever that blend was. But what's cool about it is that you have to listen to what other players are doing, what they're talking about during the course of the game, and very simply, you just go, okay, I'm, I'm in. I'm in on what you're doing. You don't have to pay anything. It's all positive. And I've actually, and many times you'll see players helping when you have this investment token on there, you can help the other team by playing cards from your hand, doing something else that will affect how well the blend works for that team. So you're actively affecting another team when you're not even on it. And I think that's awesome. So let's do the bad. And then we'll get into the final, final few slides about how to uh, uh, put this into your own games, right? So the bad thing about positive player interaction is perceived as lighter. So even if you have a super heavy game, if it has, opens up any sort of social aspect with this helping each other thing, it can be perceived as lighter. There's some examples that are not, like, a, I don't know if you, there's a game called Demonker, which is a five-hour original Euro game from Germany about German politics. It is a fantastic game, however, it sounds like it's not a fantastic game. And um, it really is very cool, but it's really heavy. The, that one can get away with it because it's so heavy. But when you have uh, light, uh, these games will be perceived as lighter. Also, the strategy, the strategy is less obvious. What I mean by that is it's counterproductive to work together with other people. So if you're working together with somebody else, you don't necessarily know what your goal is in that scenario, and it's not obvious that I'm just punching you in the face. If punching you in the face is the deal, I know how to do that, right? It's easy. Um, so it's a little harder. And then runaway leader issues still pop up in this because if you're working together with the leader, I mean, how do you stop the leader if you're working together with them? Kind of hard. So you have to, so it takes a little bit more uh, uh, negative feedback. It takes some feedback loops and things outside of just player interaction to keep people diverse and divergent and get rid of those uh, runaway leader issues. And then um, you need reasons to die. So if you, if you are all on a level playing field in one of these games, with, which has some positive player interaction, it just doesn't work. It falls apart because two people can just create an alliance, stick with that alliance, and sit there for the entire game. So you have to give them a reason to stop doing that. And of course, it's not really a two-player thing. I mean, there's ways to get around it, but really, like if you're if you're just helping someone else out and it happens to be the other person, then it's just the other person. You might as well just not do it, right? <clears throat> so, we'll get down to it, but um, positivity in design, I just think we're moving as a society towards more positivity in everything. You see gamification being like that thing that's on the news, and I don't necessarily agree with all, all the things that are happening, but at the same time, Positivity is a thing, and it's something that is real, and it's a, uh, a part of game design. Uh, video games, you'll see this a lot, video games like Animal Crossing, Undertale, Witness, Minecraft, and countless casual mobile games show that conflict is just a choice. It's not, it's not the main impetus for the game. Um, you could say man versus puzzle or something is, is like the, the type of conflict, but it's it's underplay. And a lot of times the goals are actually defined by players. And that is a game if it has goals, so in a challenge. So it's hard to define. But we're also starting to say that uh, in modern game design, if you're awarding negative points to people for, for actions, it's also taboo. Right? Like, that's bad. Negative points are not seen as a good thing anymore. Um, it used to be a thing, but it makes games really heavy. And a lot of people have the, uh, uh, have a fear, uh, what is that, uh, loss, fear of loss, and um, they, loss aversion, there we go, <coughs> loss aversion to losing points, and when you take away points, they really, really <coughs> feel it, they have an emotional reaction that's stronger than you might expect, so you want to avoid heavy things, unless you make a really tiny game that doesn't have much strategy, you can add in negative points to make it feel a little heavier, make the decisions a little better, or super heavy games. Whatever, go crazy. Um, but um, I can't really say why positivity should be in these, in competition and everything, but 
I don't know, I think it's just a new avenue to explore, something that we've been doing in modern gaming for a while, and it's, it's cool. I, I, I really enjoy it. Um, and then finally, let's get to the final end thing here, how to add some things to your game design. So if you're thinking about making a game and you want to add some positive player interaction, here's some ways. So the first step is just being aware of the option. Thinking about the fact that you could add positive player interaction to your game is the first step, right? So uh, some examples, my battle, my game is a battle game. Well, okay, if game alliances occur in battle games, so don't just let them happen, incentivize it. In a game Eclipse, which is a 4X game, most 4X games are like space opera style games that last like 12 hours. This game, like two. So it's good. It's like, it, and, and it's still meaty, right? Um, but it has this ambassador system. If you ever meet someone up, meet someone in space when exploring, you can go, okay, hey, guy, I, I, I want to be on your team. Let's, uh, let's, let's do a treaty. And so you trade ambassadors, which is one piece. Take a cube from one of your economic tracks and place it onto that ambassador. So you unlock one of your, a little bit more of your economy by making this treaty. And now both of you have benefited. So alliances are now good. If you ever break that alliance, you lose minus two points at the end, which makes the game a little heavier. But the thing is, whoever breaks the, tr the, the treaty at the table, like from all players, last is the one that scores minus two points, not anyone who breaks a treaty. So kind of incentivizes breaking the treaty earlier, right? Um, and then screwing people over at the end. Um, but uh, my game is a bidding game. Well, I just came up this at the top of my head while writing this, and I was like, well, okay, what if you have a bidding game where two top two bidders win? Right? So we bid on a lot of things, and top two players win, and then the highest bidder gets to split the loot into two piles and the second place person picks which one of the piles they want. Right now, you have both, uh, that's the I split, you choose kind of mechanic that you use for like kids that can't figure out how to like share things, right? So you split the cake that way. But what that does is just, I don't know, that sounds like a cool game, just that, that just splitting up the loot and having two people bet on those things. It's kind of interesting. And basically, my game, but my game is, there's all kinds of excuses why you can't add it, but you can totally add it. Uh, even Lifeboats is what I consider one of the most vicious games I've ever played. And it's so simple. Basically, you start the game off as one of these characters, not necessarily First Man or Frenchie, but you start off the character as a character. And you're all on this lifeboat, and the rations are going down, and eventually they will go out, and everything will be there, and you will be just adrift at sea, killing each other and dying, and starving. Right? And the people who survive at the end win, and like, will we'll score some points, right? But the thing is, it has this, it even knows that in a game where you're throwing people overboard, knocking them out, trying to kill them, and then even though I think there's even a cannibalism card in there at some point, you have this aspect of love. So at the beginning of the game, you're given a card for someone at the boat that you hate and someone on the boat that you love. If the person that you hate dies, you score that amount of points. If the person you love lives, you score that many points. So you could sacrifice yourself just to score points for them. It's a lovely love story that ends in death and <coughs> destruction and starvation. It's great. Basics of plausible player interaction for me are hidden information, an asymmetrical start, and quickly emergent divergent strategies. What does all that mean? Well, hidden information is just stuff that Cards that other people can't see. Things, things that other people don't know. Um, an asymmetrical start is something where I have something that is different from you. Whether or not it's like a single resource that is a different color, or whether I have an entire different setup or race <coughs> of characters, right? It's different from what you have, so we have a reason to diverge immediately. And that gets into diverging your strategy. You want people to be you want people to take different strategies as fast as possible. You want people to have reasons to work together, but reasons to break apart because the problem with permanent alliances is that they break games. So whether it's positive or negative, alliances that stick with an entire game are bad. So you want to break those apart. Um, give players reasons to diverge. Give players reasons to betray, even in positive player interaction, and create dynamic teams or interactions. Make sure that they want to.
to move to these other things, but they have a reason to work together with other players, right? And I'm going to skip those, uh, those two because we're getting a little long. So the last thing, last little slide before I read the final slide, right, is there's two other little things. Force positive player interaction. It's a situation where the game will not allow players to complete an integral task unless they collaborate with each other. So you can put this into your games to make sure that there's a wall. There is a specific spot where people have to work together in order to get past it. What this does, it creates a collaborative environment, but it also makes it so that if someone is falling behind, they have an opportunity to not be involved in that. And they can do something else. It really does help in kind of balance, self-balancing it, and it also makes it interesting. An example was an action that can only be taken if two players choose it, right? If two players work together to do it. Very cool. Um, and then finally, positive reinforcement. Just like you want to break up alliances and make sure that things are dynamic throughout the entire game with positive player interaction, you also want to reinforce that working together is important. Because a lot of people, when they see this, they just go, there's no reason why I would ever want to work with somebody. But the reality of it is that if you work with one other player, you are better off. If you turn to the next player and you work with them, you are better off. As you work with other players more than the other players at the table, you are better off each time that you get the same net benefit as another player. So it's a good thing. And then slow or deny progress of players go to That's just a way to just stop people from just doing whatever they want. And finally, before I end here, all I want to say is that all the stuff that I've said here today could be backwards. It could be used in the exact opposite way of what I've said, and that things like positive player interaction could be something completely different. You might come up with something really cool. But whether the interaction is subtle or over, active or passive, back or backstab, multiplayer games rely on player interaction. A good complex game should have a mixture of most, uh, all or most of the elements. So make sure that you're thinking about positive player interaction when you are making your games. It can be negative totally, but if you have one positive aspect, it might take your game from just being a good game to a great game. Use all the tools that are available. Thank you. Thank you.